Good morning, everyone. My name is Brittany Christopher. I'm the physician assistant at the Center for Breast Health, and it's my privilege today to be presenting to you all on mindful eating for the breast cancer survivor, the pandemic edition. And I'll be co-presenting this with my colleague, Cynthia Choi, who you'll meet in a little bit. So I always like to open with something a little lighthearted, and many of my patients have been coming in recently saying, you know, the pandemic's real, my stress is real, and I am noticing it in my waistline. And it's true, it's really had a big impact on people's nutrition. We've seen all sorts of results of this pandemic, including increased stress and anxiety, feelings of isolation, increased family responsibilities with schools closed, daycares closed, less opportunity for physical activity, real disruptions in sleep-wake cycle. And those things have in turn then led to some other significant impacts such as limited shopping times, certain grocery stores having changed hours, certain foods no longer being available. Unfortunately, the hard topic of job loss in this very difficult economic time, food insecurity as a result. And we've seen just a dynamic shift in meal times and eating habits, how are you preparing your foods, and it's a very multifactorial thing that's unfortunately led to this very real weight gain problem. So mindful eating or mindless eating is really what Cynthia and I want to speak to you guys about today. And subconsciously, we're actually making nearly 20 decisions about food every day without even realizing it. Mindless eating is unfortunately a lot of what goes on once we're starting to feel stressed and anxious. It's when we're eating without purpose. We're bored, we're sad, we're depressed, lonely. There's no menu planned. Maybe we're reaching to package convenience foods. We're skipping meals, we're eating too fast. So what we wanna try and bring attention to today is mindful eating and how that can help you and empower you with your weight control. What's mindful eating? It's eating with a purpose. Am I hungry? Am I thirsty? It's when you actually go to eat because your body says it's time to eat. It's taking the time to meal plan ahead. It's trying to see if there's an opportunity for meals made in the home, setting designated meal times, and enjoying your meal time. All these components lead to mindful eating. A couple other graphics for you. Something of interest with mindless eating, they say that based on the first thing you see, you're 30% more likely to pick it up. So when you look in the cabinet and you see a bag of chips, your intake and influence is gonna definitely be skewed. Also, just talking a little bit about smaller plates and smaller appetites. Portion control is something that gets brought up a lot. When there's less in front of us, there's less inclination to have to feel the need to eat more. So mindful eating involves paying full attention to the experience of what you're doing in selecting your food, in preparing your food, with eating and drinking inside and outside of the body. What does that mean? It means the use of all five senses, colors, smells, textures, flavors, temperatures, are there sounds when you're choosing what to eat? And acknowledging your response to foods. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Are you neutral? And not beating yourself up about it. It's normal to not like kale. And be aware of your physical hunger. Are you thirsty? Have you been satisfied? And using those cues to help make a decision about when it's time to start and stop eating. I think mindful eating is nice versus having this pressure to always be saying, well, what's the best diet? What diet should I be on to be controlling my weight? Because when we diet, we're really trying to focus on eating for a goal of weight loss and appearance. As opposed to mindful eating, we're much more focused on how can I nourish myself and be healthy. In mindful eating, we have a lot more flexibility and freedom. As opposed to diets, oftentimes they're very restrictive and rigid. Having all that restriction can sometimes cause us to not follow and be in tune with what we're trying to do. It's good to look at your body's internal cues when you're doing mindful eating, making food decisions based on how you feel and accepting that, you know, all foods are all right, but making wise choices. So why mindful eating for the breast cancer survivor? So we all know that breast cancer, unfortunately, has an association with people who are overweight and obese. And research has shown that mindful eating can really help decrease weight gain, alter poor eating habits and behaviors, and improve psychological distress. When you're not beating yourself up about your food choices, it's easier to then have a better calm and peace about what you're doing in your day. There's strong evidence that mindfulness helps with food cravings, portion control, and the long-term benefit of weight reduction. 
healthy weight leads to the prevention of additional chronic diseases and significant to our patient population, you all, wonderful, wonderful patients, is that we know if we can keep our weight under control, we can decrease our risk, we can decrease our risk of breast cancer recurrence. At this time, I'd like to hand it off to my lovely colleague who will introduce herself. Hello everyone, my name is Cynthia Choi. I'm an oncology dietitian at the Virginia Hospital Center. So Brittany um, talked about the today about the mindfulness eating. Let's talk about the how we are gonna be do it. So first you have to prepare the, your environment to eat. So let's just turn off the TV or cell phone or any kind of extra electric device just to turn off and tune in. And eating with the distractions. Uh, we have like, uh, I've seen the, my, you know, the friends who actually had uh, one hand as a cell phone and watching the TV. And also there is a computer. And so it's, uh, we have uh, so many electric device on and then while we are eating. So let's just uh, turn off everything. And when you're eating, just eating and eating with others. I know that it's a little strange time to we have to have a like um, social distance, but if you are have a family, just to set the time and place. You will see the two picture. One of the picture is eating the sofa, watching the TV. They are all not looking at each other. So we'll have a like a designated time and then eating at the dining table and has a good conversation with the family. Next slide. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. And um, also practice the slow down. So, uh, you know, the eating, my grandmother always told me just to chewing slowly at least 10 times before you swallow. But I never listened to her. And then, um, but you have to just to, what you have to do is chewing slowly. That way you can taste the food. But most of the time we chuckle down the food and we never chew properly. So one time I just counted myself how many times I chew and then swallow the food and I, to be honest with you, I have like a five times chew before I swallow the food. So um, 10 time, why is it 10 time? 10 time is a starting to your digestions. Chewing is a starting to the digestion. So, so it's a, like a, your saliva is a mix with the food. They kind of separate to the carbohydrate and breaking down to the glucose. That's all starting your mouth. So try to chew uh, as a proper method and try to take the small bite and sip before you have a big bite. And to not eat and run. And I just had a, like a little illustrations, which is the Chinese character for the uh, rice. You know, the, that's the meaningful is the Chinese um, farmer when they are harvest the rice, they have to using for their hands for 88 times. That's the what's the mean for the rice. So we have to think about where they are coming from the food, and uh, you know how we have to really, really appreciate it's the food into the our plate. And Brittany mentioned it about uh, you know mindfulness eating is a focus on to the five sense, color what kind of color, texture, smells, and flavor, temperature, sounds. Please be pay attention to the what, you, what kind of food you are eating and think about the, that five cents. And then this is illustrations for the whole body mindfulness eating. You know, brain to head to toe. So all the body is involved with the mindfulness eating. So, um, you know, the usually when you are eating the portion size and you are not full, but you are keep eating, we don't really have a portion control a lot of times. So the brain and stomach, they usually talking each other for the 10 to 15 minutes. 
when you feel full, you fall 10 to 15 minutes ago. So try to eat the, your right portions. And I also adding to the, some of the COVID-19 pantry food. Brittany mentioned it to the, when you open the, your cabinet pantry and you see the chips, then you will probably grab the chips. So let's just, just to looking at the down for the food pantry uh, food uh, item. So you have a more um, healthy food choice. And a lot of bread products, so you can actually frozen for up to six, six months. And also pasta, quinoa is my favorite, uh, one of the grain. They has uh, some proteins and uh, some of the omega-3 and different kinds of vitamin. And also the protein-wise, fresh meat, you have to cook it in the, within the two days, but you can uh, frozen to up to four months. And a lot of canned meats, you can use tuna, chicken, salmon, and lunch meat, I don't really favor it to the dose of lunch meat, but you can use it up to the three to five days. Egg, my one of the favorite thing is the dry beans or canned beans. So those are thing is a very staple. Um, you know, you can cheap, but it's a great protein source, and a lot of nuts or the peanut butter or nut butter. Fruit and vegetable. Usually fresh fruit and vegetable, they don't really last long. So if you can, frozen fruits or frozen vegetable, they actually can tend to do longer period of time you can store. Also the nutrition wise, it's not that big difference between the fresh or frozen. Also the dry fruit, which is that you can actually dry the fruit itself or sometimes when you buying the dry fruits, they're adding to the, some sugar to uh, preserve it. So if you can have a drying, you know, food drying uh, machines, you can do that or just to get on some frozen fruits. And also consider to the daily product, they usually tend to, to not having a long period of time to store. But they had a little cart to you can actually uh, shelf stable milk, or there are different kinds of the milk you can uh, have it. So yogurt is another good one to probiotic from the yogurt to helping to the, your healthy immune functions. So we are talking about the, how we're going to be boosting immune functions to not get the coronavirus. So there is a five elements, protein, vitamin A, vitamin E and vitamin D uh, uh, and zinc. So we'll talk about the each item. So protein, of course, is chicken, fish, turkey, egg, or beans, or bean, peas, and nuts. Those things is uh, probably natural. But try to focus on more plant-based protein if you can. And vitamin A, a lot of uh, orange color, yellow color, those uh, has a uh, vitamin A. That's a high antioxidants and also helping to the, your immune system. Vitamin E is another good one. Almonds or peanut butter or any kind of broccoli or spinach has a high vitamin E. Vitamin C, which is the orange, grapefruit or strawberry, blueberry, tomatoes, and red bell pepper, pineapple, banana. And zinc is also a good one to you to have it. So lean uh, meats or seafood, whole grain, beans or nuts and mushroom. So those kind of food you are eating in, but you have a, with a lot of sugary beverage or a lot of fatty food with it, then it doesn't gonna be work. So try to avoid it to the excessively uh, sugary beverage or caffeine or excessively um, fat food, then you can actually helping to do your weight management and also helping to the uh, healthy diet. So final thought for the mindful eating. So let yourself feel. So let the body to see if your stomach is grounding or you feel hungry or thirsty 
And so also, if you fall, then just stop. Do not, you don't have to be finishing the last bite if you are feel full. And showing to the, um, you are thankful for the meals. And also, um, you have to have a uh, eating to the, during the disappeared time. And I know that it's everybody is a hard time, but let's just eat well and being well. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our live question and answer session. Um, you've just listened to our experts, our team of experts um, on the breast cancer treatment team, and now we offer you an opportunity to ask questions of these experts um, to help you understand everything that we've talked about thus far. Um, so the first question I have here uh, says, I've heard that breast self-exams are no longer recommended. Can you please explain? And for this question, we're gonna head to Dr. Edwards. Uh, hi, I'm um, Claire Edwards, um, a breast surgeon at the Center for Breast Health. Uh, so it's not uh, really that breast self exams are not recommended, but it's that um, we do realize for some women um, they don't get a lot of, some women don't get a lot of information or help from breast self-exams. This may be the women who have denser breasts or more nodular breasts because, a lot, because of a lot of um, benign changes or fibrocystic changes. And if you really don't feel like breast self-exam is doing anything for you or if it's um, more confusing and anxiety provoking than helpful, then I think the most important thing is just uh, breast self-awareness. And what that means is that if you do notice a change in your breast, um, whether you think you feel a mass, have nipple discharge, pain that's new, just bring it to the attention of your doctor or come see us uh, at the Center for Breast Health and we can check it out. If it ends up being nothing, great. If it ends up being something that needs to be investigated, then you know we acted on it sooner rather than later. Um, if you do want to do a kind of more routine, structured, monthly uh, breast self-exam, there are really good instructions at uh, breastcancer.org website, for example. Um, so it's still an option, but just maybe not as emphasized as it was um, in the past because of the reasons that I explained. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Um, so breast exams are still helpful, uh, but Everyone is different, and so please uh, contact Dr. Edwards or uh, your primary care provider if you have any questions. Um, the next question we have here asks, are there any alternatives to mammograms? I have difficulty tolerating the discomfort. I'm Sarah Mesban. I'm the radiology department representative here. So. Um, this is a great question. We have these questions at least uh, 50 times a day. Um, the answer is, would love to have an alternative to mammograms, but no, we do not have an alternative to mammograms. Mammograms are the main standard of care for women's imaging. <clears throat> Keep in mind, they are screening exempt. So we will try to pick up everything that could be abnormal, just from a very quick glance on your mammogram. Tips that I usually tell the patient to tolerate their mammograms is try to choose the right side, the right time of the menstrual cycle. So if your menses is about to start, please don't come to get your mammogram. You'll be more able to tolerate the mammogram and the compression after your menstrual cycles when your breast is not so tender. Also, maybe a Tylenol or an Advil can help. And the most important thing is to work with a technologist. The technologists are trained to provide the most good positioning that we can obtain good pictures from it and also to tolerate, um, <clears throat> to provide you with the comfort when they're providing the compression on your breast. So with that being said, I would love to have an alternative for a mammogram, but they are the gold standard for women's imaging so far. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, and the next question we have here, what exactly is a patient navigator?
Thank you, Dr. Hong. Um, my name is Margaret Navarro. I'm the breast health navigator here at Virginia Hospital Center. And really my main job is to eliminate barriers to care and help you navigate the system. So often at diagnosis, a patient is overwhelmed with all the tests and going in between doctors and locations, and it can get very overwhelming. So often I'm just there to help reinforce what the physicians have already talked about. Uh, I get all kinds of questions. There's no stupid question. Um, if anything, um, I love <laughs> what people, when people start, I think this is a stupid question. Those are the best ones. So I am there to field those questions, to help answer them. If I don't know the answer, I get to be in company with these wonderful people and I can get the answer for you. Uh, one thing we also love to do um, as navigators is, you know, help the patient formulate their own questions. So, you know, I, I can't come to all of your doctor's appointments with you, but I can absolutely help you write down your thoughts and get them organized so that when you do go and visit the physicians and you are getting your tests done, you're there, you're ready, you have your questions in front of you, and you can get those answered. So. I, I help, you know, listen. Sometimes people just call and I just listen. So um, anytime that, you know, there's no point in treatment, you know, from diagnosis until basically, you know, the, the end of your life, <laughs> which we will be here. Um, I work at the Cancer Resource Center with lovely um, social workers and uh, with Cynthia, the registered dietitian. So we, you know, I can get you access to counseling and therapy, and we have um, the support groups, and you'll hear more about that, I, I'm hoping. And thank you so much. Our next question, why is chemotherapy sometimes done first? And for this question... Hi, thanks for sharing your Saturday morning with us for the annual breast cancer conference, especially during these trying times. I'm Neelima Dendeluri. I'm a breast medical oncologist. Thank you, Dr. Hong, for hosting this morning's festivities. So a lot of times, despite excellent surgery and radiation, we have to give patients chemotherapy as well as other systemic therapies to reduce the risk of cancer coming back. Sometimes we give the chemotherapy before surgery because some people really opt for what we call breast conservation or they want to preserve their breast. So we want to shrink the cancer to make that possible. Other times we give chemotherapy to say, is it working? And if it is not working, do we need to give some additional therapy after surgery? Or do we need to go ahead and send them to surgery first? Or sometimes it helps us personalize therapy in terms of decreasing the number of drugs that we may give after surgery. So it's to help facilitate surgery sometimes. The other time is to try and personalize the therapy to minimize undertreatment and overtreatment. The next question we have from our audience, what can I do to reduce my risk of lymphedema. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Michelle Kondracki and I'm a physical therapist and lymphedema specialist. So for those of you who don't know, lymphedema is swelling that can occur in the limb after lymph nodes are removed or after radiation treatment. And so to prevent this, some patients can do everything absolutely right and still develop lymphedema. However, the biggest single factor to trigger swelling is infection. So we really want to try to prevent infection in the arm or the breast that had surgery. So just maintaining really good skin and nail care doing things to prevent cuts and scratches. So if you're gardening, wear gardening gloves, a light long sleeve shirt. If you do cut yourself, soap and water is still your best bet. This day and age, everyone's 
carrying around wet wipes and uh, hand sanitizer so you can clean you know, a cut or scratch pretty easily. Um, some other factors for lymphedema, trying to maintain a really healthy weight. So just keeping a nice healthy diet, exercising, especially weightlifting can be really useful in trying to prevent lymphedema or if you have lymphedema and trying to manage it. But one of the things I tell women when I talk to them is that if you feel something's off, if your arm's heavy, if it's achy, if it's full, you're just noticing something different, let us know. The sooner we can detect the swelling, the easier it is to manage it. So just reach out to your doctor and we'll you know, get right on top of watching out for that. All right, thank you for that. Uh, next question we have here is, I've had some biopsies for what turned out to be benign lumps. Do these put me at higher risk for breast cancer? Thank you, good morning. I'm Molly Sebastian. I'm one of the breast surgeons at the Reinch Pierce Family Center for Breast Health. The, there was a time when uh, about 20, 30 years ago when there was this theory that maybe women who have biopsies of their breast might be at higher risk for developing breast cancer, and that has been resoundingly disproven. So it is not true. We can say that firmly. It is not true. That being said, there is a concerted effort on the behalf of radiologists, physicians, anyone caring for women when it comes to breast health concerns to reduce the number of possibly unnecessary biopsies. And the, that's been a real improvement in our care of women uh, are, uh, with improved imaging, improved analysis before the decision is made whether or not a biopsy is prudent. But there are still times when no one can say for sure uh, without uh, no, a biopsy. And so there are minimally invasive techniques for achieving breast biopsies. Those are also very safe. Uh, generally, they're performed in a radiologist practice. Dr. Mesban does a number of them along with her team in radiology here at Virginia Hospital Center. Uh, we do some of them in our office if uh, that's uh, more convenient for patients. But in general, those biopsies are very important for solving a, an important question about whether or not there's a real issue in the breast. And it's uh, important to really look at having those done. And please don't worry if you've had uh, some biopsies in the past that showed benign results. That's fantastic. And and there there's uh, thankfully no, it's not an a risk factor that would change your risk for breast cancer in the future. So congratulations on the benign news. Our next question deals with survivorship. I have heard that some women finish their breast cancer treatments, chemotherapy, radiation, and other treatments, and then face some sense of depression or loss. Now they've overcome cancer, but they're left without their cancer routine and life feels empty. What do you recommend to these women? What have you seen, uh, what have you seen that works and what doesn't work? So for this, we'll go to our survivorship team. So I'm, I'm Sherry Citrin again, and I am a social worker. That is my background. And as a social worker, we are always taught to meet the patient or the client where they're at. And so this really stands, um, holds true for breast cancer because it's such an individual uh, disease and, and an individualized response to how people cope um, with their diagnosis and their treatment. So many patients um, have a really difficult time emotionally uh, when they're first diagnosed. And that's when they you know, have all the, the um, questions and the feeling of overwhelming uh, anxiety and fear of the unknown and the uncertainty. And that's when our team often gets involved with, with that uh, particular patient. We may meet them 
um, in the surgeon's office or in the medical oncology um, um, office to help them cope with their diagnosis, to help them talk with their um, family and their healthcare providers, and to provide some individual counseling or to get them uh, into a support group where they can discuss some of the same feelings that they have with women or other um, patients who've had that experience. Um, and But for others, once they have a diagnosis and they have a plan, they sort of go through the the you know, the daily, okay, I wake up and I need to do this and I go to this appointment and I go to this appointment and they go through the motions and they're not really reflecting on the emotional impact of the diagnosis and what that means for them. For some people, it is a, a complete change in their identity, who they are as a person. They're used to being somebody who's healthy. They're used to being somebody who feels strong and now their body has betrayed them. Um, but as they go through the motions and they feel like they're getting active treatment and they're doing well and they're supported by their healthcare team and the radiation therapists or the chemotherapy nurses, once that treatment ends, they're suddenly felt like they're, they suddenly feel that they're all alone and they're not doing anything to actively combat this disease. And that's when we oftentimes really um, see a lot of patients because they have a, a little bit of meltdown at their last uh, treatment. When everyone's congratulating them or their family members are saying, yay, you're done. Well, it's, it's not all behind them now. And we want patients to know that survivorship is a lifelong process. So you are diagnosed, you become a survivor. You're treated, you're a survivor. 20 years later, you are still a survivor. And 20 years later is when you might find that you have um, these feelings that are now coming to the surface. So it's very different for everyone. And that's why we oftentimes will recommend that even though you've had your treatment years ago, it's never too late to seek counseling for um, your experience with your breast cancer or to join a support group. We like to take a very um, multidisciplinary approach to providing support services to our patients. So sometimes getting involved in an exercise group. Um, there, I'm gonna put in a plug here for Two Unstoppable. It's a great program for women who, um, or for people who have survived breast cancer who would like to find an exercise partner or to join exercise groups. And a lot of that is being done virtually right now. So there's so many different ways to help improve your mood. Um, Scanxiety, having uh, anxiety before your upcoming scans is huge. And so if you're finding that even years down the road, you're still dealing with an overwhelming sense of anxiety or depression around the time that you need to come for your scans, please let us know. We're here to support you. All of our services are complimentary. We're stu still doing counseling by phone or through Zoom and um, we are here for you for that. Thank you for that. Our next question, does VHC offer ongoing nutrition support to cancer survivors even several years after diagnosis? Hello, my name is Cynthia Choi. I'm an oncology dietitian at the Cancer Resources Center. That's a great question, um, but unfortunately, I couldn't really support all the cancer survivors in the, this region. However, uh, first uh, th um, three years of the after the, your diagnosis, you can see me directly, and or if uh, I couldn't, I can talk to you guys over, over the phone. After that, I usually refer to the, we have a, a lot of outpatient dietitians service in the uh, Virginia Cancer, uh, Virginia Hospital Center. So I do ref, refer to the, those the, uh, patients to there. And some of the insurance or Medicare, they actually cover the three hours uh, per year for the visit for the coverage. So you can definitely find the nutrition service from the, your insurance coverage. And some of the private insurance also they do provide some of the nutrition support. So if none of them is a work, then I will happy to see you and then I will happy to talk. And also we offering a lot of a group class uh, future. So you can actually have, I have a cooking class or some of the exercise class or 
you know, some of the ask uh, dietitians or some of the in general nutrition class. So you're welcome to join to the those class. Thank you. We have a question from the audience. Um, can somebody explain the oncotype test and what that means for breast cancer patients? So about two thirds of women diagnosed or men diagnosed with breast cancer have what we call hormone receptor positive tumors where estrogen and progesterone or estrogen or progesterone can drive the cancer. So for those women or men, a lot of times chemotherapy is unnecessary. So the Oncotype DX test sends off the tissue that was removed at the time of surgery or at the time of their radiologic biopsy and says, what is the risk that the cancer can come back as long as I take therapy that targets the estrogen or progesterone and will chemotherapy help? So it's an individualized tumor test to say what is the likelihood of benefit from chemotherapy as long as someone is targeting the estrogen or progesterone with a, usually a pill. We have another genetic testing question here. It reads, who is recommended for genetic testing? I think I'm considered high risk and want to know what I should be doing to stay on top of this. Thank you for that question. Uh, genetics is an area of uh, cancer care that can quickly get confusing for uh, the general public and even physicians. And just to be clear, this question uh, pertains to stem cell genetics. When the sperm meets the egg and a person's created, the, the DNA that's set from that moment forward in a person's life, there can be glitches in that DNA that subtly mean potentially the mu immune system is not protecting <clears throat> that individual from certain cancers as well as it should. So genetic testing for hereditary cancer syndromes, assessing a person's risk based on their own family history, their own uh, breast health history, and offering a blood test and sometimes uh, even a saliva test can be used in order to look at that stem cell DNA to see if that person has one of these glitches or mutations that could be harmful and make them at higher risk. When we uh, uh, meet with patients who have a family history, this is more and more a topic of interest among primary care providers, gynecologists, we uh, at the Center for Breast Health, Dr. Edwards, myself, our physician assistant, Brittany Christopher, see patients all the time about this exact question. So we're, there are patterns in the family history that can be more concerning and be, mean that a person's appropriate for referral and evaluation for testing. In an ideal world, people who are considering genetic testing have a genetics professional, a genetic counselor even, go over their family history and explore all the possible hereditary syndromes that could be applicable and arrange for those to be tested after a discussion with the patient. So we help facilitate those kinds of visits and, uh, and that kind of testing. It's a great question and, uh, and it can be uh, difficult for uh, people to understand exactly how to get that done. So I was gonna ask Brittany Christopher, our physician assistant, to address how, how a person should, should get that done. Good morning, everyone. I'm Brittany Christopher. I'm the physician assistant with breast health and plastic and reconstructive surgery. And speaking directly to Dr. Sebastian's question, genetic testing is something that we're so happy to be able to help you facilitate. And we're really lucky. We work with a couple of genetic counselors. But, you know, sometimes we're in a situation where we just really want to get the testing process started and patients ask, what are my options? So there's actually the opportunity, if you are in a situation of first exploring testing options, to do this testing at home through a saliva test. It takes a little bit longer. When we have high-risk concerns in the setting of a new cancer diagnosis, we almost always help facilitate a blood test. 
after you've submitted your sample, it takes about one to two weeks to get results, depending on which kind was submitted. And we will, of course, follow up on that result. Was it a positive result, a negative result? Um, a particular nuance to genetic testing is something called a variant of unknown significance and walking you through, you know, what does that result mean for me and my risk and my screening? And we're so lucky to be able to also coordinate with our genetic counselors to help really help explain, you know, what should I be doing next in my screening and surveillance. Our next question is for Michelle. Thanks for these exercises, Michelle. Can they be shared with us? So I'm glad you guys like the exercises. And today's event and presentations will be posted on our Virginia Hospital Center's YouTube channel in the following weeks. Um, and I know in this time of COVID, a lot of classes are canceled. People aren't going to the gym. And there are things you can do at home. YouTube is actually a really great option for some free exercise programs. And you can you know, search seated exercises for arm stretching, seated exercises for neck pain. There's a lot of really good videos out there. Obviously, the downside is nobody's watching you to make sure you're doing those correctly. There are some paid subscription exercise programs you can do at home where there is somebody on the other end kind of watching you to make sure you're doing all the exercises correctly. And even through our cancer center, I know I've done a few exercises and stretch classes. Uh, we had one this week, and hopefully we'll continue to do some of those through Zoom. So there are some options to stay active, um, and even just walking around, put your mask on, get outside. It's really nice weather these days, and go for a walk. Next question. What are the options for breast reconstruction? Hi, I'm Marilyn Wynn. I'm the plastic surgeon um, that works with Dr. Edwards and Dr. Sebastian in the Center for Breast Health. Um, the options for breast reconstruction vary significantly based on what kind of surgery you had for your cancer, what kind of chemotherapy, and what kind of radiation you have had or will have. So if you've had a lumpectomy, surgery options include things like fat transfer or fat grafting to help fill in any areas that might be deficient after your lumpectomy, or a breast lift or a breast reduction to help improve your symmetry. If you've had a mastectomy, the options, again, mostly include implant-based surgery, which is the most common, versus autologous tissue, meaning some part of your body that gets transferred to your chest to reconstruct the breast. Um, you also have the option of going flat, which patients don't um, usually think about, but that's something that we can help you with as well if you want to have a, just a completely flat, smooth chest wall. Um, that's sort of a newer thing that I have been asked about in my clinic lately. Um, the options to go through reconstruction are there for you bef when you're having your initial surgery, or you can do it once you're done with all of your cancer treatment. You can do it one year later, five years later. The timing doesn't necessarily matter, um, with a few caveats, again, depending on what kind of other treatments you have had or will have. A lot of patients worry that they won't feel like themselves or look like themselves. And the most honest answer is that it will not be your breast. Your breast is either going to have a portion of it removed or it will be completely removed. So your new reconstructed breast will be just that. It will be a reconstructed breast. It should look like a normal breast. You should be able to walk down the street wearing whatever you want, and nobody should know that anything happened to you. But it will not necessarily feel like your original breast. Thank you for that. The next question is for me, and it asks, is it safe to get radiation during this COVID era? Um, the answer is generally yes. Um, I would say that as the rates of coronavirus in our community go, um, it affects all our day-to-day -day activities. Uh, currently, in our region, in our hospital, the positive testing rate is hovering between 2 and 3%, which is really low, and we're very proud of that number. Um, recently, there was a study from the epicenter of coronavirus in the New Jersey, New York area, where they took samples of 
uh, they, they basically swabbed common surfaces within hospital department or radiation oncology departments, and none of those surfaces showed viable uh, viral particles. So routine universal precautions that all of our departments employ on a daily basis appear to be uh, safe in eliminating surface contamination of viral particles. And so whether it's radiation therapy, whether it's surgery, whether it's uh, radiology or chemotherapy, physical therapy, there are risks generally with the virus and hence the nature of our, our conference uh, this morning. But it is safe to come into the hospital um, for some of the operative procedures. Um, I'll let Dr. Edwards answer some of the protocols preceding surgery, um, specifically for coronavirus. Um, but do not delay your care. Uh, talk to your doctor and come in and see us. It's very important. Uh, okay, yes, so the question was, um, what is being done around uh, coronavirus concerns for patients who are coming in for, to have surgery. So yes, so certainly uh, the policy right now is basically everybody who's coming in to have surgery as well as every patient who uh, is being admitted to the hospital gets a coronavirus test um, so that the status is known and if it's a uh, elective um, surgery and your coronavirus test happens to be positive, a rare situation, but something that has happened is that then there's a, you know, about a four week waiting period just to make sure you're not um, having surgery at a time when perhaps you're about to become ill. Uh, so our policy is just to um, swab everybody um, who's having surgery for coronavirus that comes from the Virginia Hospital Center um, administration level. Um, there's also, you know, uh, everybody's being very careful um, in terms of, uh, Everybody's masking, everybody's screened at the door now for temperature um, and exposure and uh, at the door of the hospital, I mean to say. Um, and uh, the visitor policy has been modified a little bit just in terms of we used to, you know, of course, just generally have um, allow any number of visitors as long as uh, they weren't in the way of, of care. And now it's really just a one visitor policy, but one visitor is still allowed. So that's how things have changed around surgery. Thank you for that, Dr. Edwards. Next question. I have dense breasts, so usually have to have an ultrasound anyway. Wouldn't it be better to skip the mammo and go directly to ultrasound? This is a great question. So um, in radiology, breast cancer, we look at three things. We look at a mass that is not well defined, which means we cannot trace the outline of the mass with a pencil. It has like a spike, it's like a star shape. That's one form of a breast cancer. The second form of a breast cancer when it's we call distortion. Um, the way I explain distortion to the patient is I say the, the shape of the background of the breast tissue is like the scale on the fish uh, skin, like arcs directing toward the nipple. When these arcs are eliminated and they become crisscross lines, this is another sign that it makes us worry for breast cancer. The third form of a breast cancer is calcifications. So the first two types of a breast cancer, the mass and the architectural distortion, these are things that we can see on the mammogram and we can confidently go search for them on ultrasound to find them. The third type of the breast cancer, which is the calcification, is something we can only see by a mammogram. So if we skip the mammogram, we will skip the calcification, noticing the calcifications. And a lot of the times these calcifications are the stage zero breast cancers. So if we wanna eliminate diagnosing breast cancer at stage zero, then we will eliminate mammograms because these calcifications, we cannot see them on ultrasounds. The, then if the patient moved from stage zero to stage one or two, the calcifications to return to a mass, that's what we call an invasive breast cancer, then this is something that we can find on ultrasound and um, on ultrasound by itself. But ultrasound also becomes a very uh, highly diagnostic uh, modality when we know where to go to find the abnormality after we're looking at the mammogram. 
So the mammogram enable us to find the cancer easier because we're having a full holistic view on the whole breast and then zooming on it with the ultrasound to confirm is it a cancer or not. And also enable us to see the calcifications which represent the early stage of a breast cancer when um, it has not kind of like a breached the outline of the milk duct and went everywhere in the body. So that's why we cannot escape the mammograms. Mammograms are very important to show us um, breast cancers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mespan. Uh, along with that, we have a follow-up question. What can we do to identify early signs of metastatic breast cancer? Um, I think a combination of physical examination, breast health, uh, clinical exam, and mammograms and screening procedures uh, are the best ways that we can identify early signs of uh, metastatic breast cancer, primary breast cancer, um, but then also following up with your medical oncologist on a routine basis um, is important. So symptoms, um, if you have any uh, aches or pains that are unexplained, out of proportion, asymmetric, um, or if you have any uh, weakness, anything like that, um, anything abnormal, bring it to our attention and we'll be able to, to work you up on a directed basis. And that brings us to our last question. Has there been any developments to determine when it is safe and appropriate to end taking aromatase inhibitors at five years or at 10 years? So briefly, we give aromatase inhibitors to inhibit the production of estrogen and progesterone and reduce the risk of breast cancer coming back. Historically, we've always said five years, but more recent data says, hey, some women or men may benefit from longer duration of hormonal therapy. And unfortunately, we don't have the magic test to say who benefits from 10 versus 5. Generally, what we do is if someone's lymph node was involved, we generally try to ask them to stay on it for 10 years as long as they're tolerating it well. Otherwise, we stop at 5. If someone has a larger tumor, Sometimes we also use aromatase inhibitors not only to reduce the risk of breast cancer coming back outside the breast, the lymph nodes, the chest wall, but also in the liver, the lung, the bone. But besides that, we also use it to reduce the risk of a new breast cancer on the other side. So all of that factors in, but there's no magic bullet to say five years is perfect for one person and 10 years for another person yet but stay tuned. Okay, as a bonus, we have one more last question, and it pertains to a very important question, and the question asks, is genetic testing for cancer needed for everyone, or is it just for targeted groups? Oh, here we go, we're fighting over the answer here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not fighting. Um, everyone can can uh, join in on this one. Who wants to? Just raise your hand if you're interested the, to add a response. Uh, so, uh, I think the the person asking the question uh, is, I think, asking, uh, should everyone be tested to see whether or not they have an inherited risk in their D their own stem cell DNA? That means they could be higher, at higher risk for uh, developing a cancer in their lifetime. And that uh, currently is uh, best evaluated in the setting of a, a medical visit with uh, either a physician, a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, or genetic counselor uh, to talk over what is the family history and uh, to arrange for genetic testing. And again, that's the genetic testing that pertains to the DNA that, that is defined when the sperm meets the egg uh, and a person's created. There's an entirely separate set of medical testing uh, that has really uh, contributed greatly in the last decade uh, or more to uh, helping medical oncologists such as Dr. Dendaluri and her team in deciding 
for a cancer situation where the cancer is already formed. When cancer happens in the body, that cancer changes the local DNA in that group of cells. And so there are ways, because we have so much experience with breast cancer, there are ways to test the tumor DNA specifically when there is a question about whether or not something aggressive like chemotherapy is necessary to help that patient get their optimal outcome. And that specific, it's called somatic DNA testing or uh, tumor DNA testing, is uh, decided on a case-by-case -case basis uh, among the treatment team. And more and more, the, that kind of testing is indicated. Uh, but it's not uh, appropriate uh, uh, for, e for every uh, person who has had breast cancer. Uh, I hope that answered the question. All right, folks, so closing remarks. Thank you for joining us this Saturday morning. If you have any questions after today's event, please email them to cancersupport at virginiahospitalcenter.com. We will send you an evaluation in the next couple of days. We ask for your feedback for future events and conferences. We will inform the raffle winner by email today. That's, I repeat, we will inform the raffle winner by email today. Again, today's presentation will be posted on our Virginia Hospital Center's YouTube channel. Um, not today, but in, in the next few days, in the coming weeks, so please look out for that. We would like to thank the Breast Cancer Team, the Cancer Resource Center, and Nancy Okasaki, Conference and Events Manager, for coordinating today's conference. <laughs> I would like to end by saying thank you to you all, our community, for keeping everyone safe. Let's wear masks, social distance, and please come in to, to get your mammograms and get your breast health care. Um, we uh, are committed to keeping you all healthy and safe. Thank you.